very glad to be here today to talk a little bit about um, our health system and some uh, opportunities that I see for all of you as you think about uh, the next phase of your careers and think about the industry that has become so much a part of our national conversation and our work. Um, I'm going to talk about BMC and set it up a little bit in where I think uh, healthcare policy in our country really intersects with how we provide healthcare. I will start with a brief, I promised everyone a brief infomercial about Boston Medical Center. Um, I'm going to do a, a more, uh, more uh, just a little bit of information about the Medicaid program. I think it's the most important health insurance plan in our country, and I hope you'll uh, believe me about, uh, about that when I'm done. A little bit about how Boston Medical Center is transforming um, to preserve access to healthcare, and then finally, uh, why I think we're going to be good at it, and why I think it's important, and why I think you should all come work for us. Um, so a little bit about Boston Medical Center, as you can see on the slide behind me, we have a long and distinguished history. We're one of the few hospitals that was actually formed by enabling legislation. It was the merger of a then city hospital, Boston City Hospital, and University Hospital, which is a 501c3 like any other uh, not-for-profit hospital you'd see around town. We were merged about 25 years ago, and at the time, the um, enabling legislation had a sentence in it which turned out to be prescient, which is that BMC is to be the centerpiece of the city's public health network. And I think our ways of being successful really have focused on that. Um, we've been around uh, for a long time in one way, shape, or form. Um, as I like to say when I talk about this slide from President Lincoln to President Trump, we've had basically the same set of challenges, uh, which is uh, shaped by the patients that we serve. Our system is comprised of a hospital, Boston Medical Center, a faculty practice plan, a health insurance plan, a network of community health, uh, community health centers, and now increasingly um, our a Medicaid ACO, which I'll talk a lot about, a, counter, a Medicaid ACO, which more about. You know, our, this is sort of BMC by the numbers. I won't belabor this slide except to say that um, a lot of people don't know about our health insurance product, which provides peace of mind and access to 420,000 low-income patients across Massachusetts and New Hampshire. We're known for our trauma care and delivery. I was talking to Trevor earlier. I call it the was taken to phenomenon. When you hear about our hospital, it's always somebody's rushed there or they were taken there. And lots of people, a million a year, come for their, for their, for their routine and primary care and specialty care, just like every other hospital, but somehow in this market, BMC stands out as the trauma center. Uh, we are the primary teaching affiliate of the Boston University School of Medicine, so every year, 700 fresh faced residents, interns, and fellows find themselves on our campus to learn about how to become the uh, best physician they can be, um, and as you'll hear, uh, the bulk of the people that we serve are, uh, pu are publicly insured. Um, just to drill down a little bit on our patient population and why I think it's such an exciting place to work. 70% um, of the patients we serve are underrepresented minorities, more than minorities, more than patients live at or below the federal poverty limit, which in the city of Boston is about $20,000 for a family of three. Um, about a third of our uh, uh, medical activities happen with translator assistance, which is a, a pretty complicated uh, journey for us. And um, most of our patients really are uh, a really working poor people who are struggling to uh, educate their, their kids, um, find housing for themselves and for their family members, and live the life they, they, uh, they the best life they hope to live. Um, you know, our mission, and we're very proud of this, it goes back to when we were formed, is to provide exceptional care without exception. And as we began thinking a little bit more about what does that mean as healthcare is changing, we came up with what we call our Vision 2030, which is to make Boston the healthiest urban population on the planet by the year 2030. And um, the cynical people on our campus say, well, that's gonna happen anyway because of gentrification, but we think we can, uh, we can, we can get there by, and, and really, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, but the, 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 the theory is that um, if you actually want to preserve access to health care, you have to bring down costs. The only way to do that is to get people healthy and keep them well. I'm going to take a minute on Medicaid now because I think it's something that probably isn't talked enough about across our country. It's the insurance product healthcare executives like me love to hate. But I'm here to say that 
We love it now. I think it's the most important insurance product, and let me tell you why. Uh, it provides uh, care to one, uh, one in five Americans. 50% of the births in this country are provided by, by, the, by a Medicaid product across, and there's 51 different versions of Medicaid, or 52 if you come Puerto Rico across our country. Um, more than 70% of the people in getting long-term care services in our country, those are paid for by Medicaid in our country. People sort of think of Medicare as old, but if you're in a nursing home, you're covered by Medicaid. And uh, people over the age of 85 are the fastest growing demographic in our country. One in three of those people will need total care because of dementia or other, other neurologic challenges. So think about what this, what this uh, insurance product's going to mean um, in the future. I think it's also uh, some of the slides I just some of the facts I just I just spit out. But think about vulnerable populations in our country. They are almost exclusively uh, insured by Medicaid. I take a minute on um, substance use disorder and opiate opiate use disorder. Um, Medicaid pays for one in four patients getting opioid treatment in this country. So as we think about uh, solutions to that problem, or even apps, as we think about ways to reach people who are struggling with substance use disorder or other behavioral health challenges in this country, you have to think about the Medicaid payment system as a piece of that of that um, of that puzzle, because that's where people are getting their care, particularly as they they fall deeper and deeper into the, into the grips of addiction, lose their jobs, and end up being covered by Medicaid. Um, a couple of other facts on, uh, on the opioid uh, use disorder on this slide. This is primarily um, an issue of men, although we see lots of women in our hospital. Um, it's interesting to see that the, uh, that the rate of uh, deaths from overdose really predominantly affects men. I, I didn't know that till, I put this, till we put these slides together. Um, and that um, state Medicaid programs have a lot of purchasing power. So what they insist people do, for instance, um, the provisions of, provision of naloxone or Narcan, so that when somebody gets a heavy the opioid prescription, they should also be given Narcan um, just in case they need a reversal agent. Those kinds of things Medicaid's able to do because they have so much purchasing power in the opioid space. So I'd ask you to think about that as you, as you think about the challenges of this, of this epidemic, which uh, is killing more people than HIV AIDS did in the, uh, in the, in the 80s. Um, almost every state in the union is worried about their Medicaid problem. It is, um, or their Medicaid program, because it, it is, Medicaid is eating state budgets. In Massachusetts, it's 40% of the state budget. So if you, you know, and Massachusetts is a prosperous state. So think about the revenue growth we've seen in this state and the fact that 40% that, that, um, that, that of the state budget is being used for, uh, is being used to provide access to health care for low-income people across the state of Massachusetts. Faced with that challenge, many states are thinking, well, what do we do to help uh, manage the cost growth of this program? And many have turned to uh, accountable care, which is sort of this, this generation's version of managed care. I'm sure there'll be something in the future, but, but we have to get our arms around what health care costs in this country. Um, so how is Boston Medical Center participating in this? I'll use it as an example of an, what an accountable care program looks like and hopefully uh, convince you that, um, that we have a good chance of, get, of, of succeeding in this program. Um, as I said earlier, uh, uh, Medicaid's 40% of the state budget. What you might not know is that one in four people in Massachusetts are, are insured by the Mass Health program, by the state Medicaid program. You stand in line at the grocery store behind people who have Mass Health and who likely have, have SNAP or food stamp benefits. I, th I think we don't think about that this way. We're standing in this big, beautiful building, but a lot of people across, um, across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts need um, the state support to get access to health insurance for themselves and, and for their families. Um, Ma Mass Health wanted to do a lot of really great things with, the, with, their, with their ACO. It's a really well-designed program, although uh, the actuarial uh, stability of it is in question right now. But the first thing they wanted to do was make sure people had access to primary care to improve the patient experience. They really worked to um, integrate behavioral health. You know, for many, many years, our healthcare payment systems in this country behave like our head stopped, like our body stopped here. And the disconnect between behavioral health and physical health, I think, has driven a lot of the cost challenges challenges and dissatisfaction that people see with the healthcare delivery system that we see. So that what you see throughout the, throughout the ACO product is, and the way it's been rolled out across the state, is a heavy, heavy emphasis on making sure that behavioral health services are, remain available to the patients that the state insures. They're using their purchasing power to make sure that that happens. So why do I think BMC can be successful? 
Um, first, we have uh, used the statewide presence of our insurance plan to cover people across the state, which gives us a little bit of geographic uh, uh, variability and frankly gets us out of the very expensive uh, healthcare market that is the city of Boston. Um, if you look at this slide where, where, our, um, where our ACO is, is uh, predominant, you'll see that uh, that it's largely low-income communities like Brockton, Springfield, and Fall River, New Bedford. It's also where 45% of the fatal overdoses in the state of Massachusetts occur. So our ability to export what we've learned at BMC through our work at the Graken Center is really important to the health of those communities. Um, you know, I think, you know, when I think about BMC, I think it's like this great experiment. You know, we have an incredibly diverse group of patients, but kind of one payer, it's Medicaid. We have a health plan, we have a medical school, we have a dental school, we have a public health school, we have a network of community health centers. It's all kind of right there. So why can't we just kind of dig in and, and do a really good job and run this experiment well so that, and come up with results that are replicable across the country? That's our hope, we'll see. Um, you know, social determinants of health is a kind of a buzzword. I understand you, uh, we, you guys have talked about this earlier today. As we think about social determinants of health, we think about it at BMC and do a really good job and it's done. Um, we have had a therapeutic food pantry at our hospital for the last 15 years. Doctors and nurses can write a prescription for anyone who identifies food insecurity. You get a three-day emergency supply of food that feeds your household. It's in your healthcare record. We know if you've got hypertension or diabetes or if you're allergic to peanuts. Um, um, and, it, um, and it addresses the kind of hunger we see in this country, which tends to be episodic. People run out of money at the end of the month. People have, somebody loses their job and their uncle's sleeping on their couch. The food budget doesn't stretch as far as you'd hoped. So um, for the last 15 years, in cooperation with the Greater Boston Food Bank, we've been feeding people over a million served, which I know sounds like McDonald's, about, um, <laughs> but isn't, <laughs> but, uh, and, um, and, and uh, 7,000 patients a month uh, visit our food pantry right now. I'll tell you about one other program because I think it's not something a healthcare executive typically talks about. It's a program called Street Cred, started by two of our pediatric residents. You think, how does a pediatric resident have time to start a program? Interviewing a mom, difficult visit, mom's kind of weepy at the end. He says, is there anything I can help you with? She said, I don't know how to do my taxes. And he said, I think I can help you with that. Now, you're a low-income person. You're eligible for an income earned income tax credit, which is about $1,000. If you go to H&R Block or one of the tax, uh, prep neighborhood, tax prep places that pop up in low-income neighborhoods, they take a look at your, at your income, they, uh, at your W-2, they do one of those 1040 easy forms, they say they, they know you're eligible for $1,000 and they give you $600 on the spot. With street cred, we were able to bring back into our community um, almost $3 million in the last three years of people who were eligible for that, for that, for that income, but it was going to, uh, to tax preparers, not to take anything away from them, but let's be, let's be real, people really needed this money. And um, the thing that struck me the most as the, as the CEO of BMC, and we'll talk more about this later, was how many BMC employees were eligible for their in earned income tax credit and didn't know it. Um, oh, here's the picture of street cred. Sorry, I meant to move ahead. Um, it's, you know, it's not fancy. So as you guys think about companies and services and programs to help low-income people, um, don't be sort of dazzled by the app. A lot of the work that, that we do at BMC is very retail. It's also very, um, it's pretty simple stuff. If people are hungry, feed them. If people need help with their taxes, get some volunteer people to, to help them with their taxes. So at night in, in pediatric clinic, for the next couple of months, there'll be people, there'll be people helping folks with their taxes. Um, the other thing we've thought a lot about is what investments do we make as an organization as we think about the cost of healthcare and how social determinants drive that in the wrong direction? You know, the classic story of somebody who's admitted to our hospital uh, because he's homeless and has missed dialysis for the last couple of weeks and is in the hospital 13, 15, 20 times in a year. So we've begun to make some very modest investments in what I think of as five flavors of housing investments. I won't belabor them all, but as I said to somebody earlier today, the, the last person you want building beds, housing beds, is a hospital executive. We can't do them for less than a million dollars a bed. So who do we partner with to create housing support for our patients? The folks at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, which is a fabulous organization, if you don't know about it, always say to me, Kate, it's more than just a key. 
So we have to think about how people fall into homelessness and what services and products we need to bring them to bring them out of it. And what role does a healthcare delivery system play in creating access to those services? It could be as simple as grab bars in public housing in the city of Boston, and we go and put that in ourselves so that people can get discharged, or it could be as complicated as, as, uh, as respite beds for people who are chronically homeless who need a place to, uh, to recover from their surgery rather than the streets. Um, I talked a bit about substance use disorder, and this is really just to tell you that this is a complicated problem. I mean, I think that the uh, that that it, it kind of snuck up on our country. I think if we go back to when pain was the fifth vital sign, when hospitals were asking everybody, "Are you having pain?" and sending people home with with enormous quantities of of medis medications that were not supposed to be addictive but turned out to be, um, we have a real challenge in making in mainstreaming addiction care into the healthcare delivery system. If you believe that opioid use disorder is a chronic disease. Think about the treatment methodologies for it. Um, you know, nobody says to people with diabetes who have a chronic disease, you need to line up at 6.30 in the morning holding your urine to get your insulin, which is what happens to people who go to methadone clinics. So what we've tried to do at BMC is, is mainstream addiction care into every place that a patient touches us. We have a very strong program for women struggling with opioid use disorder when they're pregnant. We have a program for new moms called SOFAR if you've had substance use disorder. Uh, we have it in the emergency room, we have it in orthopedic clinic, we have it in psychiatry, and I think it really has uh, been um, a a remarkable sort of burgeoning of, of new knowledge of innovative programs and of support for patients who are struggling, um, which we think will begin to reverse the tide of this epidemic. So I have a few questions I'd like to ask. We have some questions that have been submitted uh, by the audience through the app. And then, of course, this being Harvard Business School, we have cold calls. Okay. You know, if we feel like it, we can do it. I kind of have my eye on the section over here. Um, but why don't we start? I'd like to follow up on, on something that you mentioned at the beginning. You said that. Medicaid is the most important health insurance program in our country. And I think that uh, those of us who've been involved in providing care in very urban settings you know, agree with that. Uh, the application of Medicare, of course, was ex or Medicaid was expanded greatly with the ACA, and, but it's you know, very dependent on where, where you live. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about innovations in Medicaid that you see say, on the insurance side, and then is this, is, in your opinion, is a policy solution for the country, uh, everybody talks about Medicare for all, but is, th is the policy solution really, you know, expanding the ability of people to buy into Medicaid or, or covering more people with Medicaid? I, I, I think it really is. I, I'm, uh, you know, I think it covers 73 million Americans right now, which, am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, I think it covers 73 million Americans right now, so it's really important, and I think the intergenerational nature of the coverage is what's so important. It is literally cradle to grave. And I think people don't think of it that way, but I think it's, it's, and I think that people being able to buy into Medicaid, I mean, one of the things that has been a challenge in Massachusetts, relatively profitable state, um, but as the gig economy expanded, your Uber driver, the person who takes care of your kids, the person who cleans your office, they are likely to be on mass health. Now, how their income eligibility relates to this from a W-2 standpoint is something the state has really worried about because it's not good for the state of Massachusetts for 1.8 million people to be on mass health out of a state of 6 million. So can people buy in? Should people be able to buy in? Can people buy in on the low end of the, of the Affordable Care Act exchanges? I should have actually highlighted that that's about 90,000 of our, of our health insurance business. But um, I think it's actually really important that, that Medicaid for all, particularly also because of its behavioral health and substance use disorder coverage. And, and as a uh, couple of follow-up questions on, on Medicaid, so you know, the conventional wisdom among providers is that Medicaid is such a low payer that you just can't possibly make ends meet with a payer mix like yours, but somehow you're not only doing it, but you are providing all of these other benefits to the, the community. So what's the secret as a provider? To, you know, is there a, a shift in perception that providers should have in how they look at Medicaid as a payer? Um, probably three things. I think it, it speaks to um, 
providing Medicaid at scale. I think the scale between our hospital and health plan has really helped. You know, in, if you, until we started thinking about this more comprehensively as a system, inevitably the hospital would have a good year and the health plan would have a bad year or vice versa. So we kind of got a little arbitrage through that. Um, I would say, frankly, uh, if you look at our finances, it's not that pretty. Um, you know, I always tell the private equity people on our board, like, you'd never buy us. Um, and, uh, I mean, and so you have to sort of adjust your expectations. And I think the third piece is really to think about how to spend that Medicaid dollar in a more prudent way. So prudent investments in housing as opposed to yet another emergency room visit in 10 day stay is really what we're experimenting with now. And I would say the jury is still, is not out um, because the, the data look, the early, early data for the ACO does not look great in, for, in terms of total cost of care. So we have to get our arms around it. Interesting. Um, I, in the short time that I've been here at Harvard Business School, I've been really impressed with the enthusiasm of many of the students toward uh, seeking ideas and you know, pursuing solutions in the Medicaid space. So if you were to give career advice to the students about, you know, where ought innovation to take place within Medicaid, either on the payer side or the provider side, or providing services to payers and providers who are in the Medicaid space, are there any ideas, uh, are there any ideas that are top of mind? Um, I think there's plenty of room for innovation in the behavioral health substance use disorder space. I think that you have to think a little bit about, um, except the chronicity of the disease, build in relapse as part of the model, and mainstream the care to reduce stigma. And I think those kinds of things are going to be really important. I think, um, you know, generationally, uh, you know, everybody's got a phone. Uh, Low-income people have phones. We've got to find ways to get data to them. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of an HMO. They're always reminding me to do things. You know, I, you know, I don't know. That doesn't happen in Medicaid. So how can we get, you know, sort of patient-facing apps that promote health to a population that needs it the most? Um, and I think finally. Uh, blurring the lines and simplifying. I, I, I don't know, I cannot tell you how much waste happens in our industry because even in our own, you know, our health system owns a hospital and a health plan and we deny and adjudicate claims between each other all day long. I mean, it's crazy. And the health plan people say, well, the state makes us do it and we say, but you didn't pay us. And it's, it, it's absurd. <laughs> and you're employing hundreds of people to do, to that, do that. The, the work, right. with, I mean, the fight you know with that. each other. Uh, we have an audience question, which is uh, on this point. Can a safety net hospital like BMC be a leader in tech adoption? Um, I think, you know, I, I think we can be. I, I um, you know, there's a guy, uh, uh, David Feinberg, who just left to go to Google, who was at Geisinger, which is sort of a mix of a safety net and, uh, and a uh, uh, I mean, they're the only provider in, in, in wherever they are in Pennsylvania. Sorry, I'm sure I've offended somebody. It's, well, um, that, that, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. that part of Pennsylvania. Yeah, 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 yeah. wherever they are. Um, you know, they, they're doing full genomic screening panels on all of their patients. I mean, I think that there's real opportunity. I talked about the diversity of our patient, but, but the homogeneity of the payer. I think there's real opportunity to do, do anything um, in, the, in, this, in the Medicaid space, if you can amass the capital to do it and take the risk and focus. Um, because th there are, uh, there's a lot of good ideas out there. Finding the ones that actually drive value for this patient population has been tricky. So I would think that, that on this question of tech adoption, you know, the, the greatest adoption within the provider space will either be with the most prosperous providers who can afford, you know, mistakes, or the ones who are safety net who by necessity need to find a better way. Right, that's been our, that was our thinking on the ACO, like going at risk with a crummy payer, like who does that? But believe me, fee-for-service Medicaid is no way to make a living. So we thought we'd try something else. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'd like to go back to the, uh, your comment, safety net, who by necessity crisis for a moment. And um, you know, we have this great course in the first year of the MBA program here called Leadership and Corporate Accountability. Not that I'm biased at all uh, toward that. But there are interesting you know, issues that are ethical issues around the origins of the opioid crisis, and you mentioned the overprescribing as one. Uh, you've also, your solutions in, uh, you know, addiction treatment with three times fewer unnecessary admissions and two times fewer ER visits, 40% reduction in readmissions. So as you were talking, it, you know, it sounded a bit like 
a public service, but actually there's a there's a real business model mm -hmm. uh, for you in doing this when you're you're at risk. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It um, it makes it's good medicine and it's good business to not have people in hospital beds. Period. End of sentence. And I think for us um, and people who are in a hospital struggling with substance use disorder, it's just so you know it's just a very hard patient population to manage, and the uh, the gap between what's expected of of young adults. Um, who are struggling with this with this disorder as their addiction deepens and their ability to you know keep a job, do all the things that you need to do just widens. I think the challenge for us as an employer is walking the talk. So one of the things that we've worked really hard on is making sure that as an employer and as an insurer, do people have access to treatment? Are we paying for more than just uh, medical detox? What do we do as a healthcare provider? to reintegrate somebody who's struggling with substance use disorder, do we take them back? You're a doctor or a nurse and you're impaired and you've, you're in rehab and you're sober. But we know this is a, a disease with high risk of relapse. How do we, do we put our patients at risk? Think about the challenge of reintegrating somebody into any workforce who is struggling with substance use disorder and how do we do this as a society? I think it's an enormous question. And, um, and we, you know, we were working on an employer toolkit to talk so that managers learn how to talk to people whose family members are struggling who are, or who are struggling themselves.